Thank you, Brother Victor. It is certainly a joy of mine to be here with you. I've enjoyed uh, your hospitality and the opportunity that you have given me to be here with you. And um, regarding the chicken coop illustration, I concur with my good brother, but I think he missed the point. <laughs> Uh, but we're glad that uh, you are here, and if you're visiting with us, we are certainly glad that you're here, uh, and since I'm a visitor here, it's hard for me to uh, know immediately, necessarily, whether you're a visitor or whether you're a member here, but we're glad you're here uh, either way, and we uh, hope that we have done some some things that have encouraged you. We've talked about victory in Jesus. That has been our theme and we've talked about various aspects wherein we can have victory. We're going to be doing that today again. And we're going to look at this hour in victory and overcoming temptations. And then in the Bible class hour, we will talk about victory over worry. And then in the evening or the afternoon session, we will just take that phrase, victory in Jesus. And we'll take a look at that. And so hopefully it will be encouraging to you and you'll be ready to go bear hunting with a switch when you leave here. Uh, that is, have enough faith to go forward uh, in doing the will of God. And as I was again going over my sermons for myself this morning, I thought, you know, I really need these lessons. Uh, I, I told the membership at Coldwater a number of years ago when I was doing, uh, I told them I was the local pester there. And I said, uh, I don't know if you benefit from my sermons or not, but boy, I do. <laughs> and the reason why, before I get them out, I have to get them up, and then I have to get them down, right? So you get up a sermon, you get it down, and then you've got to get it out. And uh, if you do it the way the Lord wants you to do it, you can't help but benefit from that. So I need these lessons on temptations. I need these lessons on worry. And I need to recognize then the victory that we have in Jesus. And I don't think that I'm alone in that. I think we all face these battles. You might notice in your Bibles in James chapter 1, and noting in verse uh, 13 through 15, that our Lord says some things, that is through, the, through James. He says, Let no man say when he is tempted that he is tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Here we see some things about the nature of temptation. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. Now, I've been known to do some fishing in my time. I like to fish. And I like to go bass fishing up in North Mississippi and other places. And uh, I think this illustration in fishing is about what James is saying when he says, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. You know, when you go fishing, you cast out a bait usually called a lure, right? It's something to lure the fish. So here's that old largemouth bass just sitting there minding its own business and this uh, bait comes by and what does he do? He says, I think I want that. Now, you know it's not really legal to snag fish. So the devil doesn't come along and just snag you and me. He throws out a lure, right? And we look at that and we say like that old fish, I think I want to take that. And so that bass comes out from under its cover and it grabs a hold of that bait, that lure, but then he realizes something. He's hooked. And so it is at times, that's the way it is with us. We take a hold of that temptation. And if we're not careful, we want to let it go, but we've learned something. It doesn't want to let us go. And then it says that when uh, it is finished, it brings forth death. Well, I said when it's finished, it brings forth the skillet, the frying pan. <laughs> that old fish is cooked, isn't it? Well, the devil is fishing. And he's fishing for you, and he's fishing for me. But what we need to do is be, you know, someone said that a, a, a fish doesn't get caught if he keeps his mouth shut. So what we need to do at times then is learn to not take the bait, right? 
the, the Lord warns us about that, about taking the devil's bait. But I'd like to suggest to us, and while that may be somewhat of a humorous illustration, in all seriousness, friends, man has an enemy. You have an enemy. This enemy that we have can be ruthless in his attacks on man. If you will study the book of Job, you will see just how ruthless Satan really is. Here is a man who was serving the Lord faithfully. Satan comes along and he accuses Job before God. He says, no wonder Job is serving you because you're paying him to serve you. That is, you've built a hedge around him. He's prospering. And in essence, you've, you're paying him to serve you. God says, of course, that is not the case. He says, well, you let me afflict him and he'll curse you to your face. And so that's what Satan is doing. Job doesn't understand what's going on. We, we have the rest of the story. Job did not have it. And so what he does, first of all then, he comes along and he attacks his welfare. Here's a very rich man, but he loses everything in a storm. What does Job say? The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now notice, he didn't know Satan took it away. He thought the Lord did. Right? The Lord giveth, he said the Lord took away. But who really took it away? Well, Satan did, didn't he? But then, soon after that, you know, he had ten children. And while these ten children were gathered together, a wind comes along and blows down a wall and kills every one of them. Can you imagine losing ten children at one time? What does Job do? He said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So he didn't curse God. Many people have turned away from God for a lot less because of adversities that come their way. But I want us to see how ruthless Satan is. Here when he destroyed the man's welfare, that wasn't enough. He went and attacked his family and he's not through yet. Because Job has not cursed God, he says, let me afflict this person. And so from the top of his head down to the sole of his feet, he has these great boils or sores that come upon him. And he goes out and he just finds broken pottery, potsherd, in order, in, in order to scratch himself, to get some relief from all of the, the, uh, the pain and the itching and everything that would go along with this. But again, he does not... Curse God, he doesn't understand, he questions God, but he doesn't understand. But then along comes his so-called friends, and they began to tell him, after they sat there for a period of time and just couldn't say a word to him because they, it's like they just couldn't recognize him because he was so disfigured from all of the, this, they began to say, Job, nobody suffers like this unless he's done something wrong. And so time after time after time, they began to bring accusations against Job, and you look what all this man is going through. But I want us to see, the lesson's not about Job here. I want us to see how ruthless Satan can be in his attack on you and me. In order to get us to turn away from God. And sometimes he succeeds in that. Because we want to blame God for the misfortunes of life. And when in fact, maybe God didn't have a thing to do with it. Satan may have. And we turn to Satan then because we turn against God. Why is God doing this to me? Sometimes people will say, but friends, I would not do a dog the way Satan did Job. I would not put that pain on an animal. But Satan, in order to get you to turn away from God, you see, he's an enemy of God and he's your enemy. So we have a very serious enemy out there today who wants to lead you away from God. Your enemy is Satan. And the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Friends, he wants to devour you. He's not shy in his approach to you. He is termed as adversary, He's called the devil. The word devil means slanderer. He wants to slander you, you see, against God. He is called the tempter in Matthew 4 and verse number 3. He's called the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse number 4. So there's a great battle that's going on right now. Unfortunately, some Christians don't even know that there is a war. 
And they're like, getting back to that chicken house illustration, they come in and sit in a church building and think that that makes them a Christian. But there again, sitting in a chicken house doesn't make you a chicken. And sitting in a church building doesn't make you a Christian, does it? So there's a battle going on. Let us be alert to this battle. But there's good news. Now that sounds rather depressing, doesn't it? All of the things as we started out this morning. But this series is on victory. The good news is that temp, uh, regarding temptation is we can successfully fight against the enemy and we can win the battle for our souls. We can do that. And the Bible assures us of that. You see, we have a captain in the Lord's army who overcame the enemy already. If you read the book of Revelation, you realize Christ is victorious. We have victory in Christ, and if you want to come over, you've got to overcome. That's really the message in the book of Revelation. Our enemy seeks to conquer us by deceit and by temptation. He doesn't have any power over us, but that which we will allow him to have. You see, the devil uses deceit. He has wiles. Preacher back home on one occasion, we have a brother in the congregation there whose name is Wiley. And the preacher got in the pulpit and he said, the devil is Wiley. <laughs> so after services, I went to Brother Wiley. I said, Brother Wiley, did you hear that man call you the devil? He said, I sure did, Brother Bland. He was looking right at me, he said. <laughs> Well, it's not, he's wily, meaning that he uses deceit and trickery. He wants to trick us. But we want to note something about temptations today. First of all, all will be tempted. The text tells us in James 1.14, every man, meaning every person, is tempted. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. You remember that he even tempted Jesus. Matthew 4 and verse number 1 and Luke 4, 1 and 2. Satan comes to Jesus and he tempts him. Now, here is my point. If he tempted Jesus, the Son of God, you know he's going to tempt you and me. If he's not afraid to go and tempt Jesus, well then he's not afraid to come and tempt you and me. But here's some good news. As you read Matthew chapter 4 and you read Luke chapter 4, you realize that Jesus did not succumb to the temptation. And how did he overcome temptations? Did he use miraculous powers in order to shield him from the sin or from temptation? No, he did not do that. I'm so thankful that he didn't use his miraculous ability to overcome temptations because I don't have miraculous abilities. I don't have the ability to miraculously overcome any temptations that come my way. But what did Jesus use? He used the Word of God, didn't he? And so he, every time he was tempted, he said, It is written. It is written. And now then, so what he did is he, he made application. You and I have that same power, friends. We, through self-control, if we know the Word of God, can make applications, right? Of the Word of God. I don't have to then succumb to that temptation. I can't, like the old uh, uh, actor used to say, the devil made me do it. <laughs> you know, the devil can't make us do anything that we're not willing to do. Now, he might trick us into doing it. But once we are aware of his tactics, we don't have to succumb to it. You remember what David said in the long ago? Thy word have I hid in my heart, I've laid it up in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. So you and I have the power here this morning to overcome, to have victory over temptations. Now, God's not going to necessarily miraculously remove the temptations. But I don't have to succumb to it. Here's the point. God does not isolate us from sin, but He insulates us from sin. Okay? He doesn't isolate us from sin, doesn't move us out of the world, but He insulates us from sin. Joseph was a man who served the Lord. He was betrayed by his brothers, you know, sold into Egyptian bondage ultimately, and there Potiphar's wife cast her eyes upon him and she began to entice him to come and lie with me. But you know what? Joseph wouldn't do that. He said, how can I do that and sin against God? And so while he was away from home, he, didn't, he did not leave God back there in his homeland. Now, you know what he could have done? He could have made all kinds of excuses, couldn't he? Don't we make excuses for our failures? Well, he could have said, you know what? I'm away from home. Nobody will ever know. 
Not only that, my brothers, look how they've treated me. Boy, I've been so mistreated in life. I ought to uh, have this enjoyment, and I ought to then seek that pleasure that's being offered unto me. And he could have done that, but he did not do that. He said, I know this would be a sin against God. Now, because of his overcoming temptation, he had more difficulties, didn't he? He was cast into prison. But there he still conducted himself in a right manner, and God was with him through all of that. You know, sometimes when we go through certain things that don't go our way, we think God's against us. You know, Joseph could have believed that, but he knew that the Lord was with him. And so when we're going through all of these things, let us realize God is still there. And it may be tough. Sometimes I need a sermon that's entitled, Get Up, Wimp. (laughs) Because we sit around and want to feel sorry for ourselves and wallow in self-pity. One person was so disgusted one time with things, he told his dad, well, I didn't ask to be born. (laughs) Well, now, how do you answer that? (laughs) Well, he said, I looked at him and said, son, come to think of it, I didn't either. (laughs) I don't know if anybody did, do you? But we're here. All right, so now face life. Let's deal with it. And, and so it's not always easy. But the simple truth is this, friends, and as sad as we hate to, to, to admit it, all accountable people, accountable people who have ever lived on the face of the earth have sinned. There's not a perfect person except Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only accountable person who never sinned. And that's the reason why then He can be our Savior. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the question is going to be, what am I going to do now since I have sinned? Am I going to come back to God? What about once I become a Christian? Does that mean I'll never sin again? No, it doesn't mean that at all. In fact, you remember what John said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But then he says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here's the point. God doesn't overlook sin, but God will forgive sin. If God would overlook sin, Jesus suffered and died for needlessly. If God was just going to overlook it in my life. Well, what God says is, is that Jesus has paid the penalty for the time that I gave into a temptation, or whatever it is that I have done, and I have sought His forgiveness. But the point is this again, friends. All will be tempted. Secondly, we need to know our enemy. We need to know our enemy. There's a strategy in military that you want to know your enemy. You want to know how he operates. And because of that, you can have some advantages. You know, Satan doesn't come to us in the red suit with a pointed long tail and horns. Well, that'd scare anyone, wouldn't it? You'd meet that rascal on a, in an alley somewhere and we would turn and, and run and uh, we'd get out of there in a hurry. Now, Satan, he's not trying to propel us away from him. He's trying to entice us. So he's, he makes things look really attractive. Sin can look really attractive. If there was no enticement to sin, we probably wouldn't sin, right? Uh, if there's some bad medicine, a bad tasting medicine out there, someone says, now you need to take that medicine. Well, if it was, you know, if it, if it tastes like cherry candy, I can tell. Why do they put that in? They put cherry candy or whatever it is in it in order to make it taste good so we can get the medicine. If it tastes like castor oil, <laughs> you can put that in banana pudding, they tell me, and it's still castor oil. Uh, you see, if it tastes bad, we don't want it. We don't want it. So Satan realizes that. So he comes to us that if you will just drink this beer or you'll be like this man or this woman and if you'll just do this and this lifestyle, why, it'll just be great. You'll be like these Hollywood actors and you'll just look happy and successful and so on. Uh, That's the way Satan pictures it. He entices us. But you know what? Jesus gives us the true light of Satan. In John 8, 44, he told those Jews who were following the devil, he said, you have your father the devil. And the lust of the father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of himself, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now that's pretty strong language, isn't it? The Bible says that Satan is a liar. He's going to lie to you in order to get you to take the bait. He is a liar and he is the father of it. How many people have said when we are suffering the consequences of sin, I didn't know it was going to be this way. 
We got our lives in turmoil. We got our lives where uh, we're not in a right relationship with God. We're going through some hard times and we realize that sin is uh, upon us and it's a little bit difficult to get out of it now. And what do we say? I didn't know it was going to be this bad. Well, we could have. We could have known. And so that's the reason why we need to know the Word of God. Be aware then of the devil's tactics. Say, uh, Paul said regarding Satan, 2 Corinthians 2.11, we are not ignorant of his devices. So know how the devil operates. And although Satan does use deceits and he has all those wiles, uh, we can be strong and fight against him. We can put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. If you will not take the time to read all those elements of that armor, but friends, you will notice this is not for a parade. You're not putting on the military garb that he describes here, this armor, to go out for a parade. You're not in your dress greens or whatever. Rather, you are getting ready for a battle. And so we can overcome Satan. So know your enemy. Not only that, friends, but prepare ahead of time for temptations. You remember what David said, Thy word have I hid or laid up in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I heard of an older preacher that said years ago, we ought to be so filled with the word of God you know, the Bible tells us in Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And this, this preacher said, we ought to be so filled with the word of God that when somebody pokes us, a scripture ought to come out of our mouth. <laughs> I said that as an illustration, and a lady came to me, and she said, well, let me tell you what I heard. I, she said, I heard it a little bit differently. I said, okay. She said, I heard that we ought to be so filled with the, with the scriptures that when a mosquito bites us, he flies off singing, there's power in the blood. <laughs> let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Don't let it just come and visit every once in a while. I, I mentioned one time, I said, you'll notice it didn't say let the word of Christ uh, visit you. And a lady said, what's the difference between dwelling and visiting? I said, well, if I told you I was going to come visit you, You'd understand that, wouldn't you? She said, yes, sir. And I said, well, if I said I'm going to come dwell with you, she said, never mind, I understand. <laughs> Let it take up a residence in your life. You know, I, I'm not this type of person that a scripture a day keeps the devil away. I don't, you know, that may be a cute saying, but the word of God needs to be in me richly, not just quote a scripture every day as though it's a miraculous power of some sort. No, that I ought to be so filled with the Word of God then that Satan's not going to get in there, right? Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. You know, Ezra was a ready scribe. What did that mean? That means he had prepared himself. He was ready. Are you ready? The Bible says that he had prepared his heart to seek the Lord and to do it and to teach it unto others. Ezra 7, verse 6, and also Ezra 7 and verse number 10. Now, we can be like Ezra. You see, we can prepare ourselves ahead of time. And consequently, we will be glad that we did. Then, friends, also guard your heart. Guard it. Blessed are the what? The pure in heart, for they shall see God. There's a lot of things that would come along and make our hearts impure. Jesus, on that great Sermon on the Mount, said it this way, You have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, that's wrong. They knew that. But Jesus went a step further, didn't he? He says, But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Therefore, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is better for thee to enter into life maim than to be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it's better for thee to enter into life maim than to have all of your members, of course, and be cast into hell. Now, Jesus is not telling us to literally go out and mutilate ourselves. I suppose a person, even if he were blind, could still lust in his heart. So plucking out the right eye is not going to stop a person if he's going to be of that mindset. Cutting off his right hand is not going to necessarily keep him from uh, lusting after the flesh. 
But what Jesus is saying is, you, you avoid, even though it may be very precious to you, or it may be very dear unto you, if it's going to cause you to sin, you give it up. Don't, don't put yourself in that situation. Don't watch certain movies. Don't watch certain videos. Don't do certain things if it's going to cause you to have uh, illicit desires in your heart. So you guard that heart. You guard that thinking. As a man thinketh in his heart, now, you don't think with this heart. Somebody says, I feel it right here in my heart, and he goes to pat in his chest, he might want to go see a doctor. If you're feeling anything in that heart, <laughs> that's usually not good. But the heart that the Bible is describing is the one you used to think with, the one that you love with, the one that you believe with. And so you guard that mind. It's a battle of the minds then, isn't it? Now, the world wants to tell us it's okay, and it puts it out there for us, but we should fill our minds with good thoughts, Philippians 4. And verse number 8. My grandmother was a faithful, dedicated Christian. She lived to be 102 years old. She obeyed the gospel at age 12. So for 90 years, she was a Christian. I believe that that lady, she just didn't think evil about, any, about, any, about anybody. I could be around her, and, and she just had a tremendous attitude. She lost a lot of her children because she outlived them. Lost her husband. She outlived him. And uh, I lived next door to her for quite a while, and, uh, but she just had a good attitude. She, she loved going to church, she loved gospel preachers, and she loved the gospel. And she filled her heart and her mind with thoughts which were good. I remember soon after getting married, now I married young, and my wife was younger than I, and so uh, we were young, and I remember my wife and I and some others sitting on the porch, and there would be some boys out there on the street, and they would be driving by, and they saw girls up on the porch, you know, and they'd blow the horn. They're flirting with the girls. I knew what was going on, but my grandmother sitting out there, waving just as big as she could, say, <laughs> said, we must know them. <laughs> she was so innocent. I remember on an occasion when it was a stormy Wednesday night, and here she came to church services, and her youngest sister came to her and said, we thought all the old people would stay in tonight. She said, they probably will. <laughs> She was young at heart, stayed current, stayed current with Ole Miss football <laughs> and, and, and her old. I remember also, just to help us in our thinking, maybe as an illustration in her life, she got a little bit too much money built up because she was drawing Social Security and didn't have much expended to her. She said, I need to spend some money. So she said, I think I'll just go ahead and buy the clothes in which I'm going to be buried in. So she did. Well, she kept living. She told her daughter later on in life, she said, well, I need to go buy some clothes in which to be buried in. One of these days, I'm going to die. And her daughter told her, said, well, Mama said, you know, you've already bought those clothes. She said, yes, but they're out of style by now. <laughs> and I thought, when she leaves here, she's going to leave in style. But you know what? It's a joy to be around people like that. I've been around certain gospel preachers. And it's a joy to be around them because they seem to be pure in heart. And it makes me just want to be better. I, would, I get around Christians who are really pure in heart. Yeah, and I enjoy, I enjoy that association. Be pure of heart. Guard that heart. Be that blessing to other people rather than dragging their minds down into the gutter, rather than uh, being the type of life that's always not thinking where it shouldn't be. Thinking. Be that person who's helping to spread good. And you'll be blessed and you'll bless others. Friends, watch your associations. Someone said, if you run with a goat, you're going to smell like one. <laughs> the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Be not deceived, evil companionship to corrupt good morals. How many of us are led astray because we constantly associate with the people of the world and their wrongdoing? And we, we get around them, and that, you know, we don't do it, but after a while... If we're, not temp if we're not careful, we'll be tempted. And I know we live in a world, and we can't get out of the world, and I don't want to get out of the world. I enjoy life. But we've got to be careful that we make sure that we live in the world and that the world doesn't live in us. You know, there's a difference in having a boat in the water and the water in the boat. Water in the boat can be dangerous, can't it? But now you can put the boat in the water. As long as you don't allow that water in the boat, you'll be all right. Then also... Draw nigh to God every day. Make it your practice to draw nigh to God. James chapter 4 says, 
Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and here's what will happen. He'll flee from you. If you resist him, he'll flee from you. Can't do any business there with you today because you're resisting him. Then he says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Enoch was a man who walked with God, Genesis 5, 22. He was so uh, good, if you will, at walking with God that God just decided to go ahead and take him as it was explained to a little boy one time or the little boy was explained to the teacher when she said, explain that to me. He said, well, he'd been walking with God and he'd been walking with God for such a long time that God said to Enoch, Enoch, you've been walking with me a long time. Why don't you just come go home with me? And he did. (laughs) That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Of walking with God and finally going to be with God. Be in a covenant relationship with God. Romans 6, 3, and 4, we we learned in this series already that we are baptized into Jesus Christ. And if I haven't been baptized into Jesus Christ, I need to do that so I can start that relationship. Draw nigh to God by prayer. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Then also continue to draw nigh to God by growing in the faith. 2 Peter 3 In verse number 18, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why we need to be faithful in our attendance, brethren. It's not to just punch the clock. God wants our heart. Why, if he wanted attendance, he could have put wax dummies in the pew. They'd have been here all the time. (laughs) But they they don't have a heart. And the problem is our heart. And God wants our heart. And so it is that when I'm willfully absenting myself from the assembly, I'm hurting myself. And not only that, I'm sinning against God. I'm not drawing nigh to God. And so it is, there's so many things that can pull us away. So be faithful to the Lord in our attendance. And then also finally, let us look to Christ. Hebrews uh, Hebrews 12 and verse number 2 says, Looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of God. Why, what was it that held Jesus to the cross? Friends, it wasn't the nails. You know, he said, I can call 12 legions of angels. You remember that when he told Peter? I remember reading when the Assyrians were going to come and take Israel, or take Judah rather, into captivity that God sent an angel and killed 185,000 of them. Though those Assyrian soldiers were tough. But one angel killed 185,000. The, the Bible says, interestingly enough, the way that is worded, it said, and when they awoke in the morning, behold, they were all dead. Did you know you can wake up dead? <laughs> According to the Bible. Well, it didn't mean that the dead ones woke up, but the people who were not dead, they woke up and they saw all the dead that were there. And friends, might I suggest to you that if one angel can kill 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night, 12 legions of angels, thousands upon thousands, a legion is somewhere between 4 to 6,000 if I remember correctly. So you multiply that times 12, I suggest they could mess up your whole day, couldn't they? Now, if Jesus could call 12 legions of angels, do you think those nails is what held him to the cross? That wasn't it. He gave his life for you and for me. That's why I need to look to him. He overcame. He loved you to that extent. He wants you to go to heaven. He is for you. Satan wants you to think that God is against you. God is for you. God is for you. He wants you to go to heaven more than you want to go to heaven. And so it may be then that I have sinned. But I need to be looking to Jesus and I need to come back and I need to get in that right relationship with God. Satan would have you to believe, well, there's no need to try. You've tried before, but you've succumbed to temptation and so it's not worth it. But remember that Jesus has paid the price for our redemption and that is why then we can have the victory in Jesus. Not the victory in Billy Bland, not the victory in you, but the victory that is in Jesus because he's willing to Forgive us of our sins. Put us on the right road. Help us get to heaven. Friends, temptations will come our way, but we have victory in Jesus. We can face temptations. We can face life with confidence and with great assurance and overcome them through our Lord. And even if it's the case where we have sinned, 
Let's repent of that. Let's get back right with God. And let's start serving God sincerely. And the Bible tells us in Mark 16, in verse number 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. If you haven't been baptized for the remission of your sins, let us encourage you to do that today. Or if you have done that, but you haven't been faithful to the Lord, and down in your heart of hearts, you know you haven't been faithful, and God knows that you haven't been faithful, and you want to come back, and you want to get right with God, you have no better time than to do that right now. We have God's blessings and assurance telling us, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a blessing it is to be in Christ, and that we can be forgiven, even though we may have sinned we can still have that victory in Jesus. So this afternoon, or rather this morning, if you're here and you need to respond to heaven's invitation, we bid you to come as together as we stand and as we sing this song.